Good, good evening, everybody. It's wonderful to have you all here. David's on vacation tonight, so you're stuck with just me. Um, this is, I think, our 65th consecutive week of programming. Uh, I want to call your attention to next week's program with Congressman Liu and Kathleen Ballou on the subject of military, uh, military and extremism and violence, uh, and whether the military is uh, facilitating some level of extremism in our society. Uh, we're going to get right to our program tonight, and I, we're excited about having this particular program. We think it'll be really fun and interesting. Great speakers. Uh, I want to first introduce Danigal Young, who received her doctorate in communications at the University of Pennsylvania. She is currently a professor of communication and political science at the University of Delaware. Her teaching and research interests include political satire and the psychology of political humor. She's interested in the intersection of entertainment and information. Her scholarly work has explored late night comedy as a gateway to traditional news and political participation among viewers of late night comedy. I mean, that's a pretty interesting uh, subject that we can all um, look forward to hearing about. Dr. Young is also an accomplished comedian. She performs with a Philadelphia-based improvisational comedy troupe. Uh, she is a research fellow at the University of Delaware Center for Political Communication and has received lots of awards for her teaching. Um, she's a distinguished fellow at the University of Pennsylvania's Annenberg Public Policy Center, and she's affiliated with Arizona's National Institute for Civil Discourse. Her research uh, on the psychology and influence of political entertainment has been widely published in the Columbia Journal uh, Journalism Review and many other publications, and her book called Irony and Outrage examine satire and outrage as the logical extensions of the respective psychological profiles of liberals and conservatives. And she's currently working on a new book and maybe she'll tell you about it when she's speaking. Uh, and uh, the new book I believe focuses on white supremacy, also a topic very relevant to our audience. Um, and we have interviewing her, Lorraine Ali, Currently the television critic, some of you probably read her every day um, at the Los Angeles Times. She's previously served the Times as a senior writer and a music editor. She's a member of the George Foster Peabody Award, uh, Awards Board of Jurors. Um, Ms. Ali is a former Newsweek senior writer and her byline has appeared in a diverse roster of publications from the New York Times to GQ to Esquire to Harper's Bazaar. Uh, and many, many more, including the Village Voice LA Weekly and the Rolling Stone. We're very happy to have you both with us tonight. And now take it away, Lorraine. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And um, I wanna welcome you all to this part of America at a Crossroads series, um, where the goal is to explore the threats and challenges to American democracy that were posed during the Trump presidency. But tonight we'll be looking at um, political satire and the role that humor has played, particularly humor on television comedy. And really, um, do Colbert, Kimmel, Trevor Noah, do they make a difference? So, hello, Dana. Nice to speak with you. <laughs> Hi, Lorraine. Great to talk to you too from the opposite coast. Yes, yes, Los Angeles over here. Um, and it's looking like you are in a lovely vacation space. So I'm a little yes. jealous. I am in New Hampshire, uh, in right near where I grew up. So. Oh, nice. OK. So I wanted to ask you first, um, you study the psychology of political humor. Can you just explain that a little, like talk a little bit about that? Sure. So, you know, humor is a unique kind of rhetoric. And I think we all know it. I think we know it in our gut that jokes do something different from regular discourse. And the question of how and why that is has been explored for decades. Um, in the realm of political humor, there hadn't really been a lot of social psychologists who had been trying to understand the unique way in which humor is processed in the brain. And I happened to start grad school the same year that Jon Stewart started at The Daily Show. So it was 1999. And uh, I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to study. And it seemed like a recipe for success. And so far, so good. Um, what's, what's fascinating about when, when Jon Stewart took over The Daily Show, we know something shifted. You know, it wasn't long before we had 9-11. And then there were the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And Jon Stewart really set the stage for what we think of 
as televised political satire today. And he trained a lot of those comics that, that we now know, right? Samantha B, John Oliver, Stephen Colbert. What's interesting to me about the psychology of all of this is that humor's magic, it's not magic, it feels magic, but what it is is that the audience is, the audience is the entity that makes the meaning from a joke. Jokes are incomplete. So a good joke actually is a mismatch between two things that are incongruous. There's a theory of humor called incongruity theory. And this is the kind of, of humor that Jon Stewart would use a lot, Stephen Colbert would, would still uses. The late night joke, the classic late night joke is there's two pieces to a puzzle and you're kind of, you, you have expectations going into the text and then those expectations are not met and you have to figure out why there's a mismatch. And in so doing, you access information from your long-term memory to make sense of it. Hmm. Generally speaking, in political satire, the thing that you as the audience bring to bear on the text is some kind of an argument or proposition or claim about how perhaps a politician is a hypocrite or someone doesn't have integrity or there's, there's a policy that is a bad policy or an institution that's broken. So that to me is fascinating because unlike traditional discourse, the meaning is not in the words themselves. The meaning comes from the audience. And there are, there are things that come from that that have a magical quality to them in terms of why it is that audiences are less likely to get angry and resist things. And it's, part of it is because we're doing so much work to get the joke in the first place. Right, and when you're talking about you know, news, just watching the news, listening to the news, reading the news over the last four or five years, it has been traumatizing, you know, wh whatever it is. I mean, it feels like we have been battered. And one of the only ways, you know, even as a journalist, sometimes where I was just like, that I could consume it was like, okay, I'm just gonna go to John Oliver, because you could. Do you think that um, the role of some of the satire has been to buffer the news in a way, or has it been more of like a release valve? I mean, where do you see it fit in? Good question. I, I heard Stephen Colbert talking about this a bit. Basically that he felt, and I think that many of the late night hosts felt this way under Trump. He felt that his job was as there were, as journalists were sometimes so immersed in the new Trump world that they almost began to normalize some of these egregious behaviors. Colbert said that his, his, what he had to do was make sure to tell the audience every night, you are not bonkers. This is egregious. Things are not right. Everything is, all of the rules are being broken and it's not in your mind. Basically never normalizing all of the many things that were done. And I can imagine, I don't know if he's talked too much about this, but I can imagine that that was exhausting for him as well. You know, to be the one to constantly check you in the mirror and say, okay, maybe someone is engaging in gaslighting, but like, I am constantly here to tell you, no, 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 your inclinations are correct. Things are bonkers. And there is some kind of solidarity in that. So there's a real social piece to that as well. During COVID, I'll just say, what a challenge because that social experience of comedy comes when you hear the audience laughing and you're like, oh, I'm not crazy. He really is bad for democracy. And then during COVID, all the late night hosts are broadcasting from like their basements. Yeah. And you're like, where, where is that solidarity? Where's all the laughter? And instead it became super intimate. It was like, no, I don't hear the laughter, but I know Stephen Colbert is telling me this. You know, I know Jimmy Kimmel is telling me this really fascinating time. And, and strangely, it still worked. You know, when you're talking about like, it's this kind of two pronged thing where, where the reaction of the audience or how they take it in as part of it, it just kind of morphed into a different thing during the pandemic. And again, they, you know, a lot of this late night or even SNL when you're looking at it, took these really terrifying times and kind of filtered them through another filter now because the pandemic changed, you know, the way that they were doing things. Yeah, and I, I get the sense too, you know, some of the SNL skits that just 
it was it felt so good to laugh it felt so good to see the comedians who we all know who are sort of part of the fabric of our lives make fun of the same things that we're going through whether it be zoom calls or whatever um so that toilet paper. yeah exactly exactly <laughs> um but you know there's also something wild that happened as these comedians were enduring some of the really traumatic moments of the last you know year plus on the day of the insurrection you know the the idea that you have a late night comedy host i keep coming back to colbert because i do feel like his voice is a, a really salient voice in these times and he he wept you know the idea that he was alone in this room and his wife was sort of helping pr produce or film the show or something he has no live studio audience and he was talking about the behaviors of trump having tweeted encouraging even say, even though he's saying you know go home on the day of the insurrection he's still saying you know you have been wronged this is not fair this has been stolen from you and Colbert discussed that and you could feel his grief. And I think many of us were grieving. Many of us that day were watching what was happening on television and either weeping or just being filled with fear. And so we, we look to them to contextualize things and to make us feel like we're not alone. And by the way, that's completely separate from like the funny stuff they do, right? I mean, some of the stuff that we have been seeing from satirists on you know for for years when there's a mass shooting we expect the late night hosts to talk about that and to help us collectively acknowledge it it's 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 a whole different world than it was in terms of television culture than it was even you know 20 years ago yeah and that's what i was going to ask you i mean i would even say that before trump it's a different world because the um and colbert you know there was kind of like a, a dovetailing because colbert coming in and you know moving from doing the bill o'reilly shtick that he did on comedy central we got to remember he came up you know lampooning pretending to be a conservative talk show host i mean that was his thing and then moving into this position that is you know a broadcast network you know huge late night talk show and so then we run into the trump years and you're talking about this medium that wasn't very political before this i don't remember it ever being like that you would they would talk about one or two things but right. i frankly thought how the hell is this going to work right. and then it was like he became the guide for our times essentially yeah and i think that he soon realized that the the moments that he was most authentic were the moments when he was most successful in his show and his authentic voice is a political voice not not necessarily by the way political like partisan i mean political like he is he is a, a devout catholic and he believes in social justice issues and he believes in democracy and so when he was speaking to those issues you could feel like that was his authentic voice and the more he did that, the more he, successful the, the show was. I do want to go back for a second. You mentioned the Colbert Report, which I think is fascinating because he started as a correspondent on The Daily Show in the mid, in the early 2000s. He had a couple of characters that he would do that were just blowhard, over the top. Um, they were ironic send-ups of these right-wing pundits, and he played them so well. And I think they were so successful that then the thought was we could do this as an entire show. And um, John Stewart was one of the executive producers then on the Colbert Report, where, yeah, for the full 22 minutes, he performed an ironic persona saying outrageous things. And I think what's interesting to me is that that lasted for several years. In at, once he left that show, the assumption was he left the show to go on the late show. That is incorrect. The way that he describes it, he left the show because he was starting to get nervous about the potential sort of role he was playing. Mm. He told um, Terry Gross on NPR's Fresh Air 
that he was nervous that if he didn't play that character really tightly, he would become the thing that he was trying to parody. Right. And so he would say these outrageous things. And if people, if he didn't play it just right, all he was doing was saying the outrageous things. Right. I think that's super important because some of the work that has been done in my field, and I've done some of this work, there are a lot of people who do not read irony as ironic. They read it literally. And that is really troubling if you're a satirist who's trying to use irony as a vehicle to take down racism, to take down sexism. If you're performing racism or performing sexism as a way of mocking it, and you assume everybody's in the know and gets what you're doing, that is not a safe assumption because there are people who will read it literally and will feel emboldened that you're actually just making fun of the left. Hmm. Do you think that um, Colbert, um, you know, Seth Meyers, whoever we're talking about, Kimmel, Trevor Noah, do you think that they helped the American public become more engaged in the political process. I mean, we're talking about an election year, all of these things that were going on when politics were really actually turning people off, of course, dividing people. Do you think they actually, like, what, what do you think their impact has been? I know that's very hard to measure, but. Yeah, but well, I've done it. So, and this is interesting because there was a debate for a while. Uh, I'm good friends with a scholar at the University of Texas at Austin, Rod Hart who had written for a long time about how he felt that the, the kind of rhetoric of Jon Stewart was so fundamentally cynical, that everything is so broken, that it is, there's no way to fix it. That's his, he felt that Jon Stewart was just harmful to America. And I'm like, I come at this as a quantitative social scientist. I'm like, well, that's an empirical question. So let's run the numbers and the numbers do not fit with that hypothesis because people who watch The Daily Show are more politically engaged, significantly more knowledgeable. Yeah, they are younger, but they, they are that group of politically interested young people that everybody's trying to find. That's why folks like John Edwards announced his candidacy for the presidency on The Daily Show because they uh. understood the demographic. So if Jon Stewart were truly um, disengaging people or demobilizing viewers, you would not find a significant positive association between viewing his show and talking politics, participating in politics, voting on election day, you know, putting up a yard sign, going to rallies, and all of those relationships were significant and positive. So the idea that there's cynicism inherent in that content, I think is a misread of what most of these satirists do I think what most of them are doing is they are criticizing the way things are. And in so doing, they're reminding us of what ought to be, right? Mm -hmm. Implicitly suggesting we deserve better. And if we wanted better, we could work to get better. Right. And they, the other thing is that, you know, you hear complaints that you know, all these guys out there, this is the, the, the they're liberal lefties. This is all, you know, and yeah. that's a tricky one because they've certainly been going after Trump and going after Republicans mm -hmm. recently. Um, but there's also, both Trump and the Republicans have posed these really detrimental, uh, you know, times to democracy. So I guess my question here is, is there, I don't want to say like a conservative side, because I don't want to play into that, but what would the other side of that be? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so I, let, I want to talk about that because that's what irony and outrage is about. I mean, so, I, and I did it through the lens of political psychology. And this um, is your book that you're in. Yeah, so I'll talk about that in a second, but I, I wanted to get to that, the, the question, you had said something at the outset there, the idea that, um, all, you know, there are so many jokes made about Trump. And um, some colleagues of mine, Stephen Farnsworth and Robert Lichter, have a book basically documenting the fact that, yes, the comedians went so much after Trump, more so even than you would have seen during the Clinton era. And we all know that Clinton was 
great fodder. It's the gift that kept on giving, yes. Exactly. <laughs> but, then, but then when you look actually at news coverage, and this is why when Trump was saying, the news are all so biased against me, the news media are all biased, you know, they're all fake news. If you look at content analyses of coverage of Trump, yeah, it was overwhelmingly negative. And I was in my, my class with my undergraduates this spring, and I was like, so is there an alternative hypothesis to the notion that all of these media outlets, all these journalists have a liberal bias? Is there an alternative hypothesis to explain why there was so much negative coverage of the Trump administration? <laughs> and a student unmuted himself and he was like, because he was a crappy president? <laughs> and I was like, right? How do, how do we measure that? How do we account for that? So that, I'll just put that, I'll just put a pin in that. To explain, as you said, the fact that yes, these satirists are overwhelmingly liberal. And I tried to run away from this question for the better part of 20 years. And finally, I was like, okay, I got to just take it head on. And because it's true, they are overwhelmingly liberal. But they're liberal, especially on social and cultural issues, right? So where you see this sort of liberal leaning of these comics, it's especially on social and cultural issues like um, gay marriage or abortion rights, environment, etc. So what's going on? There, for a long time, satirists themselves would say, well, the reason that satire tends to lean to the left is that, you know, conservatism is about tradition and the status quo. It's about stability and comedy is about challenging that. So comedy is inherently liberal, which I think, I think there's a case to be made that that is true. But I will add this to the equation. That's sort of like a sociological explanation, right? A psychological explanation is a lot, it leaves people pretty uncomfortable, but let's get uncomfortable. Liberals and conservatives are very different psychologically in terms of our underlying psychological traits. And when I'm talking about liberals and conservatives, I'm talking about um, social and cultural liberals and conservatives. So issues relating to sexuality and um, crime, especially things that, that revolve around some kind of threat, okay? And political psychologists have figured out that part of this has to do with these underlying sort of threat detection systems that exist in everyone. Some people are high threat monitors. They're actively looking for threats and they're, they're actively trying to either avoid those threats or manage those threats. Other folks are happy-go-lucky and they're not concerned with threats at all, or at, to a much lesser extent, interpersonal threat, I mean. Those folks who are concerned about threat, they do not situ like situations that are uncertain. They like things to be predictable. They don't like novelty. They don't like things that are ambiguous, okay? These are the people who will tend to eat the same four foods every day they like what they like, they like routine, they're not gonna to wanna to travel to different countries, they're not, you know. Now, there have been studies for decades on how these psychological traits correlate with some of these social and cultural issue positions, with those high threat monitors being our social and cultural conservatives, okay? So what that means is that liberals and conservatives vary in how tolerant we are of ambiguity and uncertainty it also means that we vary in terms of how likely we are to make decisions efficiently and consistently based on intuition and emotion. And I say that because, you know, a lot of social scientists are liberal, and so they frame all of the psychological traits of the left as good. It's like, oh, you're tolerant of ambiguity and you have a high need for cognition. And I'm like, okay, or you could say that you're a flip-flopper and you can never make a damn mind and you want to chew your cud for hours and never make a decision. So there's that too. So those traits, by the way, are really good for humor. Why? Because irony is inherently ambiguous. The meaning of humor is never explicitly stated. Humor is notoriously inefficient. You know, there are some people in my surveys who, when you're measuring how they respond to comedians and comics and people who make jokes, they find people who make jokes really annoying. It's like people wow. who make jokes are a waste of time. I feel like they saved us. I feel like they completely I, I saved us. 
Right. But so, but that's about efficiency. If you're about efficiency, cause you're like, I want to monitor for threat and make sure no one's going to kill me. If somebody, if Jack over here is cracking jokes, you're like, go feed him to the lions because he is undermining our survival. Mm. Right. So what I think is interesting about this is then when you look at these traits and how they correlate with exposure to political satire, appreciation of satire, they all tell the same story. And that is that liberals are more likely to appreciate and understand ironic satire compared to conservatives. Meanwhile, conservatives, what kind of content are they drawn to in terms of politics to create and to consume? It's political opinion talk. Why? It's efficient. How efficient is Sean Hannity? How efficient is Tucker Carlson? They tell you exactly who to be worried about. They tell you exactly what the threat is. They don't mince their words. They're not joking around about it. They also, they impart a sense of moral seriousness and urgency that feeds into your need to understand what you should be concerned about. So that's, I mean, put simply, that's a tiny little nutshell yeah. um, that tries to make the case or, or propose a mechanism to account for this asymmetry that we see in our media environment on the left and the right. Hmm. It's so interesting that you say, you know, the idea of, sorry if I'm, I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but the idea of um, some of the satire being inherently um, liberal because it's bucking against traditions. And, but then you look at what was going on during the Trump presidency, and that was just totally the ripping down of norms. And, and in a way, when you were watching comedy on television try and respond to that, whether you're talking about late night or jokes on Blackish or, you know, the good fight or whatever it is, series scripted television, yeah. um, it was trying to dance with that too. And it was really interesting to watch it trying to grapple with that as well, because it wasn't the same old thing. That is a great point. I think that you're running into the same tension between Trump's rhetoric of law and order mm. in the case of breaking laws and creating chaos, right? So when you're talking about, you know, the Trump administration really undermining institutions and democratic traditions, et cetera, the question is, how are those things being framed by the administration? They're not being framed as undermining traditions and institutions. They're being framed as a return to mm. you know, make America great again. So implicit in that, I think, is a real sense that underneath, underneath all of this, you know, diversity and feminism, et cetera, underneath all of this, there is a stable, predictable world where everyone has their place and everyone's in a box. And we, that is still there and we can get there. And that, so then that becomes framed as the foundation. That becomes framed as the tradition. And um, what do you see as like a really, this may be a too broad, but what do you see as like a really great piece of um, political satire, humor. I mean, we were just talking about this before the audience came in, but um, that Sean Spicer sketch with Melissa McCarthy on SNL is burned in my head forever as just one of the most brilliant things I've seen on SNL perhaps ever. It was so good. Um, so I don't know, were there particular moments where you're just like, oh my gosh, this is it. Yeah, well, let me ask you, what was it about it that, about that that made you love it? And this is just because I, I, I like asking questions too. What was, it about it, what was it about that sketch where Melissa McCarthy made fun of Sean Spicer? What hit for you? Well, the fact that she's a woman and she was dressed as him and there was just like no bones about it. She just got out and, and um, I think the idea that, you know, the whole idea that there had been this this kind of on the campaign trail leading up to it of women just being too emotional and too shrill and they were throwing that at you know hillary and elizabeth warren and whoever it was at the time right. and then she gets out there as sean spicer and she's completely 
throwing it back the other way. And then, you know, just all the, the jokes about moose hunt. I don't know. I just thought it was so, you know, it's hard for me to dissect that. Do, and I, do you know I what? I don't want to. I kind of no. just keep it the way it is. I, that's, that's the problem. Humor scholars make everything unfunny. <laughs> I'm sorry in advance. I'm so sorry. But yeah, I, but I think that you hit on, on a couple of things. We know, by the way, I'm sure that you heard this, that after that caricature, after that impersonation, Trump apparently was angry. At, and it affected how he perceived Sean Spicer because he had been impersonated by a woman, which I think is like so fascinating. It's like, did they anticipate that at SNL? Was that part of what they were doing? I don't know. Who knows? Um, well, how often does that happen? I mean, where where the parody affects yeah. what's actually happening in the White House? Right. It gets super meta, especially because I think that Trump only. Okay, I'm going to engage in psychoanalysis. Why not? I do get the sense that Trump only understands his, the meaning of him, his identity through its how it is mediated through television and on screen it like th that is reality for him and it has been since he was young right he is a mediated persona he does not exist if a trump falls in the woods and no one is there to catch it on tv <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> and that that's where he is so that's where it's so so meta i wanted to link that too to the sarah cooper um performances remember the comedian sarah cooper who would take the audio of trump at his press conferences and this was during covid when he was he would just riff about you know shining lights in places and injecting bleach and what sarah cooper did was she took the audio and she just seamlessly lip synced well, i don't know what do you say is that yeah. what lip synced yeah. the audio of Trump but did it in a way where she exaggerated the facial expressions but the timing was perfect and she re revealed him as a complete buffoon and I think the reason that was so powerful was also because she's a woman and she's a woman of color and she did it in a way where you're it's so preposterous and absurd the things he's saying and then when you're like, oh my God, wait, those are his actual words. Like, these are the things he's saying. But it plays so differently. And then you have to ask yourself, why are we okay with this person being in power and uttering these things that are preposterous? Which, and why did we not understand them as preposterous until they come out of her mouth? Right? Interesting. Wow. That's so wow. cool. That's brilliant. Wow. Yeah. And I'm now I'm gonna completely think of that Sean Spicer thing, and that's okay, um, differently. But that's that's, right. that's really that fascinating. Okay. That is okay. Yeah, I, I do want to talk about John Oliver for a second too. Yeah, he's so different. Um, you know, John Oliver does well. Let me just say, everyone here watches late night. I'm sure. Um, regular late night shows take the headlines of the day, and then they do a funny twist on it. And so the, the tradition is basically you, you start with a headline, you tell a little story, you introduce some incongruity and you reveal a joke, okay? Or the audience decides there's a joke there. What John Oliver does is he covers the issues that you're not reading about in the news, things that are under covered, that have not been given the attention and that most of us haven't even thought about or heard about. So things like the for-profit college scandal, these predatory places that are, you know, saying they're giving you an education and then your degree is worth nothing. Or um, the payday loan places, how they make money and how they are harming, um, disproportionately harming people of color and um, working class people. Totally fascinating. And what he does that's interesting is that he has on his staff a bunch of journalists a, bu a bunch of researchers. And so folks have been trying to figure out, what do we call this? Do we call this satire? Do we call it late night? Um, some folks have landed on the term investigative satire, uh, which I think is, is really cool. There is a doctoral student, Sarah Ordmark um, in Sweden, who t coined the term, I think, investigative satire or, or journalistic satire, 
which I think is, is important because it is different what he's doing. Yeah. When he covers an issue, he does it in such a way where he uses funny analogies, familiar analogies about familiar things to put things that are complicated and hard to understand in really simplified terms in ways that frame them in, and frame them in a way that you, you come away thinking the issue is either good or bad. So for example, my, one of my favorites from years ago was he was talking about the, um, uh, the wage gap the question of, is there a wage gap? How big is it? You know, are, are women really making less on the dollar? And he started out his segment talking about the different statistics about the size of the wage gap. And there are arguments and Congress people fighting about how big the wage gap is. Oh, you know what? The wage gap isn't that big. Women are earning 89 cents on the dollar. Other people are saying, no, 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 it's 70 cents on the dollar. Other people are saying it's 95 cents on the dollar. And he simply says, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. If somebody took a dump on your desk, would you say, well, it's only an inch long dump. <laughs> it's not a six inch long dump. Or would the problem be that someone took a dump on your desk? And I'm like, that's it. A familiar analogy. We can all imagine what that would be. And we would all say, it doesn't matter how big it is. <laughs> it's that it exists that is the problem. And that's what John Oliver always does. And some of the work that I've done with some of my colleagues at the University of Delaware he has been successful in educating people on issues from campaign finance to net neutrality, getting them not only to understand those issues, but to come away with an understanding of what the issue means and then how they feel about it, whether or not they support or oppose these policies. Mm. So that's fascinating to me. It is. And, um, I'm going to go to some questions from um, the audience out there. And this okay. is, and I wanted to ask you this too. So I'm glad many people have asked this what your thoughts are on Bill Maher? Because I find him really yeah. Tricky and problematic. Yeah. So this. About where he fits in. Yeah. Yeah. Where does he fit in? So a lot of folks ask me about Bill Maher or um, Dave Chappelle and other comics who say things that can be incendiary at times. And they say, you know, should they be doing that? First of all, you, you never say should with a comic because that just doesn't even work. There is no, they have no normative obligations, right? That's just not, that doesn't even make sense. And most comics are reflexively oppositional. So if you tell them not to do something, they're going to do it. So that doesn't make sense to me. Um, but in terms of whether or not the things that he says or does are good or bad for democracy, I think that's a fair question. And I think that what we're witnessing now with the evolution in comedy, especially in stand-up comedy, there's a real tension between young female comics, um, comics of color, LGBTQ comics, who are exploring new ways of talking about issues. And they're leaving some of the older generation of comics um, kind of out in the cold. Mm -hmm. and, they're, and they're making the argument that the kind of jokes that still support the traditional social order or the patriarchy or this or that, that those, it's not just that they're offensive, it's even worse. They're not funny. Yeah, right, right. right? right. It's worse, it's lazy. Yes. And that I think is really, really interesting. Yeah, yeah. With Bill Maher, he has always played a different kind of instrument um, with his comedy, always. He is someone who doesn't want to just be taken in by the crowd of sort of liberal comics. He, after 9-11, remember, talked about how he thought racial profiling was okay. Remember that? It was like, you know, I think it's okay to have folks on a, um, with certain kinds of names and you pull them aside to see if they're terrorists. That was a very different argument than was being made by a lot of his colleagues. Right. Yet at the same time, part of the reason he lost his show, Politically Incorrect, was because he referred to 
the not the behavior of the terrorists on 9-11, but the behavior of the United States dropping bombs from thousands of feet in the air on various places in the Middle East as cowardly. And he said, the people who flew their planes into the World Trade Center were not cowards, basically. The United States mm. were cowards. And, you, you know, you remember that people boycotted um, some of the advertisers on that show when he lost that show and then went to HBO where he didn't have to worry about the advertising. Um, and I think that that is the safest place for him. Mm. Truly. Um. Many other people have asked, what are your thoughts about the news today that Trump had asked the Justice Department to go after SNL for making fun of him? Yeah, this is so, this is such a wild story. And I believe that's what the Justice Department's for, right? They go after people that make fun of you, I think. Right? Oh, wait, I know, that's irony. I know <laughs> what you're doing. I get it. Um, what, what's super wild to me about all of this is the idea that you have an administration that's all about, you know, anti-cancel culture and how dare, how dare they try to police our speech. And yet, as president, I'm going to look into the FCC, the FEC, and the Justice Department to see if they can stop Jimmy Kimmel from making fun of me, which is so fascinating. Um, I'm not sure if he, in that regard, is nefarious and anti-democratic or just not smart about what is actually a violation of people's first amendment rights uh i'm not sure but i think it's fascinating and i think um jimmy kimmel responded last night and talked about it and the way that he responded he he couldn't even believe it he was like seriously the president was looking into like what having his henchmen take me out like you go down the list, it's like the FEC, the FCC, the Justice Department. What's next? Like, are there going to be people outside my door? Um, I think these revelations are shocking, but it's also not the first time that it happened because LBJ famously was very displeased with the jokes the Smothers Brothers were making at his expense. Um, he later said, you know, no, I understand satire is supposed to push the limits, etc. But in his in his small circle, it was very clear that he would have preferred that the Smothers Brothers in 68 and 69 just be quiet and uh, and stop making fun of him. Nixon also was famously very sort of paranoid about comics making fun of him. Um, and he was especially offended by the jokes of Dick Gregory, who was an African-American stand up comic who his humor was, you know, scorched earth humor. And Nixon famously, like, like many people, Nixon said, is there anything we can do about this guy? Which I think is so fascinating too, because I'm like, I wonder too if that is um, emblematic of a certain kind of personality, right? Mm -hmm. that you can't make fun of yourself. I just think it's so fascinating. Someone with that level of power worried about someone on stage making jokes. Yeah, well, we have somebody else asking, was Obama's comedic skill a key ingredient to his political success? Yeah, I well, know. I think that, I, yeah, great question. I think that Obama's rhetorical skills across the board were a key to his success. He was also just had really good timing in terms of delivering, um, powerful moments in speeches. You'll remember the speech that he gave at the DNC, and I believe it was 2004, when he said, there is not a, um, a red America and a blue America, there's the United States of America. And everyone was like, who is this guy? He's magical. Like everyone wanted to get up and cheer. Um, I think that he had a rhetorical gift and part of that also was understanding timing and understanding audiences. And that's what a lot of comedians have. Yeah. I, I think that it wasn't necessarily his sense of humor that made him so political success, politically successful as it was his intellect and skills as an orator yeah. made him successful. Uh, we have another question here. In your studies, have you ever come across evidence that humorous news programs like Colbert or The Daily Show actually changed people's point of view? Great. 
question. All these are so great. Um, here's the deal. I went into this business assuming that they did. In certain rare cases, you can find what are called conditional effects of media, meaning the effects of exposure to late night comedy jokes on attitudes or opinions are conditional on some aspect of the audience. So a lot of my work reveals political knowledge is an important driver here. For people who do not have a lot of politi political knowledge, who are not watching the news all the time or reading the newspaper all the time, if they watch late night comedy, they will be more likely to have their views affected by the content of those jokes, which makes sense, right? Because if you don't have a lot of political knowledge, you don't have a big storehouse, a big warehouse of information to serve as a buffer for whatever the incoming arguments are. So that's one place where we do find effects. What I think is, is persuasion effects are hard to find in general, just all the time. But here are some things that we do know late night comedy does. And you can see how this matters, especially with someone like John Oliver. Late night comedy is excellent at putting issues and people or events on people's radar, on setting the public's agenda. So now if late night comics are just talking about the same stuff that's in news headlines, okay, you'll set, a comic will set the audience's agenda probably in the same way that the news would have set their agenda that day, because it's all the same stuff. But John Oliver, by talking about issues that are not covered as often, by, co by covering those things that people don't know about, he can put something on your radar that wasn't even there, that you didn't even know existed. And that, that is impact, that is influence. And then we have another question here. Um, they're saying John Stewart, Colbert and the like, um, during the Trump years as a Democrat, they kept this person in the audience, I think their name is Lauren, they kept her sane or him sane. Mm -hmm. But during democratic administrations, they seem to have more difficulty being funny. It is, is it more difficult to parody or poke fun at characters from your own political persuasion? And is our comedy becoming as fractured and polarized as our politics? What a good question. Yeah, that last part, the answer is yes. Our mm -hmm. comedy is as fractured as our politics. I think that that is um, lamentable. I think it's, it's problematic. Um, I, with regards to the question of, is it harder to make fun for these liberal comics to make fun of democratic presidents? I don't know. I, I don't think so. And here's why I say that. Jon Stewart was doing his show for all of the years that Obama was in the White House. And just because there is a Democrat in the White House doesn't mean that all of a sudden, you know, there's justice in every way, in all forms, you know. So Jon Stewart did a really good job highlighting things that were continuing to be problems. He actually put some pressure on Obama, you may recall, to deal with don't ask, don't tell. Mm. We were, I forget how far into the, the um, first term of Obama's administration we were, but he had yet to repeal don't ask, don't tell. And so Stewart really turned up the heat there. Um, I'll, I'll tell you what, P people ask, used to ask Jon Stewart, do you wish do you secretly wish that George W. Bush would be reelected in 2004 so that your job would be easier? And Stuart would be like, you don't ever watch my show, do you? Like, you don't understand how deeply I feel these things. If you think that I would rather have four more years of this than have my sanity just to be able to make jokes, then that's a misread of what I, what I do and what makes me tick. Mm. Um, yeah, it probably is. It probably is harder. They probably have to work harder. That being said, I think that the Trump administration was a nightmare for comics because the reality of the world was so flipping outrageous that there often were there was no twists that you could put on it, right? Because the punchlines were the real things that were actually happening. Yes, they were more outrageous than any joke you could tell. Right. Yeah. So like you couldn't come up with some creative analogy to be like, you know what this is like, because the thing that this is like is the thing that he actually did that day. Right. But then where's the joke? I, so I think that that I think that was actually challenging. 
And several people have asked questions along the lines of cancel culture. So, yeah. you know, are these political satirists censoring themselves because they're concerned about being canceled? Or like, what kind of role is cancel culture playing? Because there is also um, people on the far, far left that, that also just don't find things funny because everything is, you know, uh, insulting or whatever, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Um, I am, this is something I'm so fascinated by and I feel like I'm still in the process of understanding it and unpacking it. I talk about it a lot with my students because my students are, so think my students right now are 18 to 22 years old mostly and they struggle with the question of cancel culture because many of them feel that cancellation is too severe Yet at the same time, they also feel like there should be the ability to call out someone for engaging in behaviors that are offensive or racist or misogynistic. Um, but they also feel like cancel culture itself is, it's often a performance. Like people are expressing themselves performatively by calling other people out for things so that they themselves look morally superior like they have the high ground um i don't i don't know I'll, I'll tell you i do people have said oh cancel culture is bad for comedy i disagree and i disagree because some of the stuff that we're seeing from the younger generation of comics it's so creative there's so much like narrative storytelling and like vulnerable um autobiographical accounts it's a different kind of comedy and I'm really enjoying it because it's new and different. It's very fresh. So I don't, I don't see it as bad for comedy. Um, I also am in the minority in terms of what I've heard from folks on the left in their responses to the Dave Chappelle special Sticks and Stones mm. that came out on Netflix. I really, really liked it. Mm. And the reason I really, really liked it was because he made it clear that he is still the ultimate satirist because he will make fun of you, his paying fan. He will call you out for being impossible to please, for being, you know, so quick to want to cancel someone. And, you know, I, I do respect the satirist that is going to leave us feeling uncomfortable when we think that we are the ones who are completely right because there's nothing more dangerous than people who are completely certain that they are correct. There is nothing more dangerous than that. And so when satirists get us to, you know, feel the, the earth shake beneath our feet, like, wait, am I being wrong? That's, that's wonderfully powerful. Yeah. And it, they've, done their job and done it well because the idea of you know the whole idea of I, I only need something that's going to confirm all my views and you know we don't need more of that you know we do not. yeah um, so I want to thank you all out there for your questions and then Dana I just wanted to give you a few minutes if you wanted to do some closing remarks here um, it doesn't have to be stand up it doesn't have to be satire but it can if you want it to be <laughs> no, no, I think that I think that everything here that we've talked about, we're, we're in such a serious time. And um, I'm just going to talk for a second, sort of philosophically about satire and why it's so important. And satire historically has played a very important role in in, in democratic cultures in particular. Um, even in monarchies, dating back centuries, you have the court jester, who in many ways was considered to be a sorcerer or somewhat magical because people couldn't figure out how they were engaging in the insults of the king that they were engaging in and not getting murdered by the king. So there is this real sense that there's this power in satire. So democracies generally protect satire in a unique way. It's not just free speech. It's protected. It's a particular class of protected speech. and. I think that there is an understanding that being able to weaponize words 
and do so in the spirit of play and laughter. And that's what's key here, is that it's always in the spirit of play and laughter, and the satirist always is saying, but what do I know, I'm just a comic, which people get really frustrated by, but that's part of what allows them to play the role they're playing. Because they're not saying you have to agree with me because I know everything, which PS is why Bill Maher gets into trouble sometimes. Most satirists say, what do I know, I'm just making jokes, right? And that sort of self-deprecating rhetoric is what is disarming and then makes us feel like, okay, so we can listen to what they're saying a little more. Because they're not saying that they have the truth. They're saying that they're experimenting with possible alternative truths and narratives, and maybe the truth might be somewhere in there. I think those understanding that that kind of rhetoric is so powerful because it can introduce new ideas, put things on our radar, get us talking about things, challenge us, get us wondering whether or not the view that we held for a long time might actually not be the right view. And it does all of these things without violence, without threat. I mean, that's the beauty of satire, is that it is a way of advancing oftentimes very aggressive arguments without the risk of violence. And I know it almost seems preposterous to even put those two things in the same sentence, like jokes and violence, but you can understand when a president is willing to go to the Department of Justice and say, is there anything we can do about this comedian? You know, there's a reason why satire is protected speech. I will also say to those, well, I would I would never say, here's what comedians should do, because I think that that is a misunderstanding of the role of comedy. I think it's important for comedians to understand that, as I said earlier, engaging in meta humor there is a risk to engaging in meta humor. Meta humor, again, is performing the role of that which you seek to mock. So if I pretend to be racist to make fun of racists, once I put that irony out there, it's not mine anymore. The audience gets to decide what it is. So when Archie Bunker was making fun of black people and Asian people and women, and people who had misogynistic and racist views watched Archie Bunker and saw him as the hero of the show, Norman Lear lost control of the narrative. So as long as comics understand, you can engage in this kind of speech, but you gotta, you gotta ask yourself, what is my goal? You gotta also have an intimate understanding of the audience, and in today's fragmented world, where everything can be decontextualized and shared online and go viral, you do not control who's gonna see it. So you don't know that the people who are going to consume what you're saying have signed that implicit contract that you usually get to sign with your fans at a comedy club, for example. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really eager to see where satire goes. I'm especially excited to see um, some of the new comics who are doing such wonderful stuff. If you haven't seen Amber Ruffin on the Peacock Network, her stuff is so sharp. Um, we need more women comics, we need more women of color comics, and I'm excited for the networks to give them their shows. <laughs> well, thank you so much. This has been such a fascinating and fun talk. Um, and it's rarely fun to talk about politics, though it's so necessary, but this has been great. Great, um, same. great questions, Lorraine. Yeah, and thank you out there for your good questions and great questions. We didn't get to them all. I'm sorry, but like we had a ton of them. We just didn't have a lot of time. Um, I just want to remind you that on June 30th, there'll be a program here on extremism, violence, and the military with Professor Kathleen Ballou, Congressman Ted Liu, and KPCC's Larry Mantle. That'll be next Wednesday at 5 o'clock. And I wish you all safety and good health. And thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, Dana. Thanks so much.